I'm so excited to be here. My name is April Christina Farmer. It is my pleasure to be able to serve you guys today. For those of you at the Missouri City campus and West End and online, I am so excited to meet you, so excited that we get to have this time together today. Well, as Patrick said, I live in Atlanta um, and I get the opportunity to serve as the care and baptism director there at Buckhead Church in Atlanta. And care um, encompasses crisis mentoring and counseling. So that's a bit, a bit of what I get to do from day to day there at church. And I love serving in ministry and working in ministry. I'm also a wife to Mr. David Farmer, my boo thing. He is in Atlanta. He could not come today, but I miss him and I can't wait to see him when I get home. I also have two boys. And I'm excited about them and just I love being a mom and I get to do a lot of things wear a lot of hats Um, But before I took my job at Buckhead Church, I got the opportunity to work in my profession as a community-based therapist. And for community-based therapy, you get to kind of go where people are. A lot of times when you go to counseling or therapy, they come to you, they come to your office. But I love the opportunity to be able to kind of meet people in the community and be able to serve them in that way. And one really cool part about what I got to do was teach parenting classes and life skills at our local county jail. And I know that might not be everybody's scene. Everybody doesn't feel comfortable walking into the jail. And it was awkward sometimes. But I met some amazing people. um, And got the opportunity to really connect with a lot of people who are in some really daunting situations. I heard so many stories. Jails are full of stories. Life is full of stories. But there, I got to hear a lot of stories. I heard a lot of stories about pain, about desperation, about uh, sorrow and shame, regret, Just a lot of deep stories. And today we're going to take a look at a story. Today we're going to talk about a story um, about a person who had gone through life and had gotten to their last resort. Just like these people that I met in jail, they had come to this place in their life where they're coming to us and they're desperate. And they're coming to us and they had reached this point where I don't know how to go further. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they had reached their wits end and they had come to their last resort. So we're going to take a look at a story um, of a person who had run out of options. A person who experienced Jesus as their last resort. Now there's a common phrase that's often used and I think many of you have, may have used it and I've used it several times. And it says this, it says desperate times calls for desperate measures. Have y'all ever heard that? Ever use that? And it's true, you know, in a sense, desperate times do call for desperate measures. But how do we really know when a situation is truly desperate? You know, how do we know when we have truly, actually run out of options? And typically we start to hear people use, uh, start their sentences with phrases that say things like, I am going to lose it if I don't. Or I have just got to do X, Y, Z, and then everything will be okay. Or if I could just get to this particular place in life or do this particular thing, then all of a sudden I know everything would be better. But what we know is that there are varying levels of desperation. What you might hear from a person that is a desperate situation may not seem desperate to you, and vice versa. My son was in a desperate situation once, and it involved a girl. Right, all the time, it always involved a girl. My son got the opportunity to go away to a boarding school in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was about an hour and 20 minutes or so away from where I lived. And so I dropped him off at 15, that was probably one of the hardest things I got to do. But I dropped him off and this particular weekend he was coming home for a visit and I always like to be home when he's there. But that weekend I had to go out of town to California. So I told my son, I was like, hey, I won't be here but your uncle will be at the house with you and your brother, y'all have fun. You know, you know, do right, be right, and I'll see you next time. And so I made my way there, and I did my thing, and my son knew the rules, and he asked me, he was like, Mom, yo, you know, you know that girl I met this summer? Can I hang out with her? I was like, absolutely not. You know what the rules are. <laughs> my rules were this. If you, you can't date if you can't drive. If you can't drive yourself there and pay for it, you're not ready yet. You just haven't reached the point in life where it's time for that. Hey, yes, I got some witnesses. Don't hate the player. I'm just kidding. But 
those were my rules. And so my son knew what the rules were. And so I went on my way and I came back. And so I'm traveling back, but I didn't get to see him. And so he had already gone back to Chattanooga and I'm, I got off the plane and I'm in my car headed home. And so I called my son. I was like, hey, how was your weekend? He was like, man, it was great. I said, well, what'd you do? He said, I hung out with my friends. I hung out with the fam. You know, we went to church this morning. Church was great. We had an awesome time. I was like, well, good. I hate I missed all the fun, but I'll see you soon. So I hang up with him and I call my brother, just checking in, like, hey, you know, how are the kids this weekend? How was everything? He's like, man, everything was good. The boys were good. I dropped Christopher off at the movies to see his girlfriend. I was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> hold up. Wait, 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 wait. What did you say? Uh, I dropped him off. I was like, what do you mean you dropped him off at the movies to see a girl? He's 15. He should be able to see. It ain't up to you whether he gets to see this girl. And so I'm kind of just all upset. And that boy knows. I was like, you know my rules. You know better than that. So my son's desperate situation caused a desperate situation for me. So I told my brother, I said, well, you're going to have to hang out at the house a little while longer because I'm about to make a trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I got in my car and I drove straight up an hour and 20 minutes. I just landed from California, but I was, I was in a way. And so I get in my car and I drive straight up 75 to, to Chattanooga and I get to his dorm and I push the call button. I was like, hey, Chris, how you doing? He was like, I'm fine. Mom, didn't we just talk? What's up? I was like, um, is there something you left out about this weekend? I think you need to talk to me. He was like, no, everything was cool. We went to church this morning. We had a great time. I was like, mm-hmm. I said, this is when my mama voice comes out. I said, I'm here. Get downstairs now. He's like, I'm sorry? I was like, little boy, <laughs> get downstairs right now. And he knew the jig was up. He comes down there. He's like, mom, what you doing here? Like, what's going on? I said, we need to talk. You need some, it's confession time. You got some stuff you need to say to me. And so he finally just kind of gave it up and he knew he was caught and he was just like, he said those words, those famous words, but mom, I just had to see her pretty brown skin. No, little boy. I was like, I don't care. I was, I was so upset with him, but he had gotten to that place of desperation. And you know, we laugh about that, but in his mind, it was a desperate time and he was willing to do whatever it took to see that girl. He was willing to break the rules. He was willing to push the envelope to get to where she was. And what we often find is that in times of desperation, your level of determination is based on the value placed on what you desire. We place value on so many things. And for some of us, it's, 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 it's common things. things. We place value on things like success and on building wealth and a nest egg and relationships and our health. We take value in that. And then oftentimes, we, uh, there are things that we take for granted that other people place a whole lot of value in. Things as simple as food or shelter or safety an opportunity. And there's a story uh, in the book of Mark that we're going to take a look at. And it starts around about chapter 21. There's this guy that Mark introduces to us named Jairus. And Jairus is a synagogue leader. That means this man is a person of position and status in the community. And the scripture tells us that Jairus was in the town and Jesus was in this town. And there were lots of people around and Jesus was doing a lot of healing and just really doing a lot of miraculous things. And this synagogue leader heard about this Jesus. And so he made his way from his home because his daughter was deathly ill. And so the scripture tells us that Jairus came to where Jesus was and he got before Jesus and he desperately and earnestly asked Jesus, my daughter is at the point of death. Would you please come with me to my home and heal her? And Jesus, in all of his awesomeness, said, absolutely, you lead the way. And so as they're making this journey, there's people all around. They're intersected by another story. And this is the story of a woman, a woman who had also placed a high value on something that she needed. And when we look at her story, it may seem at face value that she needed one thing, but what she needed more than anything was freedom. And there are three key elements that we're gonna see as we look at her particular story. And the first thing that we see as we unpack her story is desperation. This woman was desperate. And so in verse 25, it says this. It says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. So I want to unpack this, these couple of verses real quick and look at her level. We talked about that before, her level of desperation. So let's see what comes out first. First of all, we see that she is a woman. Why is that significant? Well, in this day and time, in this particular culture, women had no value. They were the property of their father or their husband, but she had no status. She had no pull. Unlike the person we talked about before, Jairus, he was a synagogue leader. So there was a level of, 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 of privilege that he had to be able to even be in the room and approach Jesus. But this was a woman who at face value had no value. The second thing we see about her is that she has no name. She's just called a woman. She has no name. Nobody took the time to even find out who she was so that we had a record of what her name was. And then the next thing we see is that she's identified not by a name, but simply by her condition. She was subject to bleeding for 12 years. So that's the identifier that we have with her. Unlike J. Iris, who came on behalf of his daughter, this was a woman with no name identified by her condition. And she was coming to Jesus herself. She didn't have a representative. She didn't have a person of status and position to come on her behalf. She had to make her way on her own. And so we see that she is in this place and she's all alone. And then it says that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And so this woman who was subject to bleeding had a condition. This condition made her ceremonially unclean. April, what does that mean? Well, in the Hebrew culture there, if you go back and look at the Bible in Genesis, there's all these rules and lists of things that would make a person unclean. Bodily fluids and all kinds of things. Touching a dead body is just a whole very weird. Go check it out if you want to. But it's a lot of stuff. But she was ceremonially unclean. But how did this translate for her? This meant that as long as she had this condition, she was ostracized from the community. She had no access to people, places, or things. Because if she touched anything, what she touched became unclean. Whether it was an object or a person, if she sat on a chair, that chair had to be purified and cleansed. If she touched a person, that person had to go through a process of purification until they were then made clean again. So this lady was in a bad predicament, and it was for 12 years. Imagine that, not being able to go to the market to pick up your own food for 12 years. So she was a social outcast. And it tells us that she was suffering under, she was under extreme suffering. Not only was she sick and had this condition, but it says she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. So she had gone and she had been seeking and, and pursuing all these remedies from many doctors and they didn't make her better. They made her worse. So I don't know about you, but this lady was really, truly in a desperate situation. So we surveyed her level of desperation. The next thing that stands out about her story is her faith. She was a woman of faith. And in verse 27, it says this. It says, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Talk about a statement of faith. Talk about a confidence that she had, that all she had to do was touch him. What she heard about Jesus in the street, around the way, what she heard about him was so impactful that it sparked in her a hope in her desperate situation, which ignited faith that caused her to have an action behind that. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 and 17, it says faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So I have a question for you. When was the last time hearing about Jesus increased your faith? 
I'll take it a step further. When was the last time you sharing about Jesus increased someone else's faith? It's like reviews. I don't know about you, but every time I go out of town, I have to pull up Yelp because I like to eat. And I, let me tell you real quick, caveat, Houston's got some great food. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Houston has some great food. Like anything you want, it's here and it's all good. And it's like Yelp. You pull up Yelp and you want the five-star restaurant. You want the one that has all the rave reviews and you want to go through and you want to read them. And why do we do that? It's because we don't want to waste our time, effort, or traffic time, or money at a restaurant where nobody likes the food. If the food is bad, why would I waste my time? And it reminds me of this thing that we used to have uh, when I was growing up called testimony service. Oh, I got some witnesses. Somebody knows about testimony service. If you don't know, let me school you real quick. Testimony service was a time of the service where the, the deacons or whomever, they would bring a microphone out in the middle of the floor. And anybody who wanted to share about what Jesus had done for them that week would come. And there'd be this long line and people would come up and they would tell their stories about what Jesus had done. And testimony service for me as a kid was a trip. Number one, it was always too long. They never knew how to cut people off, and everybody didn't know how to tell their testimony right. And you, but, in the, but in the midst of all that, you would always hear these amazing stories about the things that God had done. You would hear somebody say how I was sick in my body, and the, the people from the church, they came, and they laid hands on me, and I felt better, and I got better, and God healed me. And I'm just sitting there fascinated, like, wow, this is amazing. Or our family had run out of food, and I didn't have any more money, and somebody came and just dropped some groceries off at the house, and I didn't even ask, and God just made this way. And these are the types of things that you would hear in testimony service. And I remember as a kid thinking, wow, Jesus must be pretty cool. And this is what we're talking about, this testimony, this, this hearing about Jesus. And it's those stories that for me growing up that were helpful when I got into a desperate situation myself. I live in Atlanta now, or outside of Atlanta, actually in Woodstock, Georgia. But I grew up in a city called Augusta, Georgia. Anybody ever heard of Augusta? If you like golf, you know about Augusta, Georgia. Uh, but that's where I grew up. I was a daughter of a pastor. And so I, I, I gave my life to Jesus at a young age. I knew who Jesus was. I believed that he was God's son. I believed that he loved me. And I knew that I wanted to follow him. I knew I wanted to live a life for Jesus. So I gave my life to him at a young age. But what I learned or what I realized, especially looking back, is that giving your life to Jesus and following Jesus are two different things. It's like, I believe, and I want to, and I, I love Jesus, and I'm going to give him my life, but I don't really quite know how to follow him that well, and the Bible can be a little convoluted, and I, I don't know about you, but for me, it was just a whole bunch of rules. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't touch this. Don't say that. Don't wear this. Like, I couldn't wear anything. That's probably why I wear these little small earrings now, because I couldn't wear anything but, like, pearls. Can't wear big lips and all kinds of stuff. It was a lot of rules. And so walking that thing out got difficult. So over the years, just things would happen. I started to make some decisions that weren't the best thing. And so by the time I was 20 years old, I had had two children. I, had my, I got pregnant with my first son when I was 17, and then my second son when I was 19. And that was a very, very challenging time. Being a pastor's daughter, and we used to keep teenage pregnant girls who got kicked out of their houses at our house when I was growing up. And then when I was 17, I became that girl. And both of their fathers, I did say two, both of their fathers just dipped. I remember with my oldest son, I told him I was pregnant and uh, he was gone. He left the city in about two weeks. And I didn't see him or hear from him for a couple of years. And then um, my parents were so gracious. I graduated from high school and they, they allowed me to go away to college because I had watched A Different World every Thursday night for years and I was guaranteed that I had to go away to college. And so I went to Georgia Southern University, which is uh, down in Statesboro, Georgia, and I went there and had a great time and met this football player, and Lord have mercy. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm calling home again, and I remember uh, seeing him in the, in the student center, and I told him, I was like, hey, I'm pregnant. And he was like, yo, I don't want no kids. You're on your own. And so to do that and to carry that, it was so embarrassing He's walking around the yard, the big football player on the yard, and I'm walking around with a belly and nobody to help me. And I transferred back home and I just stayed there for a little while. But after I had my son, we moved back to 
Georgia Southern, and I got on all the public assistance they would give me because I was bound and determined I've got to take care of these kids. And life was hard. I was on welfare. I got the checks, and I had the food stamps, and I went in, and, and it was, I struggled. I lived in the low-income housing, but I kept going to school, and I was bound and determined to graduate. And I was doing it all by, my, by myself. I felt so alone. But what I remembered were these stories that I heard about Jesus. What I remembered is that I had made the decision to, to, to love Jesus and to receive him into my heart, but God, I'm having a hard time living this thing out. And I feel like I'm not fitting into this bubble of what a Christian life is supposed to look like. Why is my story not like everybody else's? So I graduated and we moved to Atlanta and I started doing what I knew to do. I went to church, I served, I was in the choir, I did everything that I knew to do and I could, took my kids to children's church and, and I was in small group and we, we read all the veggie tales, we watched all all the veggie tails in the world. <laughs> Every veggie tail. So I was like, no, my kids are not going to follow my path. Like, none of that's going to happen. And, um, and I did what I knew to do. But it was hard and I struggled. And over the years, I piled on guilt and shame. Every time I saw a family that looked like the picture perfect family, I felt shameful. Every time there was a parent teacher conference and I was the only one that showed up, I felt shameful. Every time my son looked up to me and like, mom, where's my dad? <sighs> I don't know, baby, let's just pray for him. He doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know how to love you the way you deserve. So I'm sorry he's not here, but let's just pray for him. And I tried and that was hard because I didn't want to pray for him. <laughs> I was mad. So I carried all that anger and bitterness and shame and regret and especially about my kids not having because I didn't have, because of my choices. And so I'd go to church and, and, and I, I felt like I fed in, but maybe I didn't and they'd have calls for like singles events. And I'm like, well, I'm single, but I got kids too. Like, can they come, you know? But you didn't fit in with the couples and you didn't fit in with the family events because you felt so ostracized. You felt alone. You felt like an outcast. And that's what I felt like. And I carried that for years. And just like this woman, I was in a desperate situation. I kept trying, but I'd heard about this man named Jesus. And I remembered stories of faith that told me to just keep going. And I'd cry to my parents and they'd be like, baby, God's got you. Just keep going. Keep trusting God. He is going to come through for you. But hearing this word about Jesus, I knew that Jesus was my only hope. I knew that he was my last resort. And just like this woman, in her pursuit of Jesus, she pressed her way through the crowd. And I pressed my way year after year, pursuing Jesus the best that I could. And she made her way through that crowd. And I can see all those people. And she's just like, I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I got to get to this Jesus that I heard can heal. I've got to get to this Jesus that I heard can free. I've got to get to this Jesus that I heard can redeem and restore my life. And she pressed her way. And she touched him and she got there. And in verse 29, it says this. It says, immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Yes! She made it. She got there. And just when you think that that's the end of the story, Mark blesses us with this final scene. Now, we've seen her desperation. We've seen her faith on display. But Jesus takes it a step further and demonstrates one final component, and that is the truth. And here in verse 30, it says this, At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus, he kept looking around to see, no, 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 mm -mm. somebody's touched me. And he kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but why was she trembling with fear? She had just touched the hem of God's garment. Like she had just gotten to Jesus. Why was she trembling with fear? 
And then I had to think about the implications of what were happening. Look in the context of what was happening in this moment. She had just, with her unclean self, this label that she had carried for 12 years, she was breaking the rules by coming out. She was breaking the rules by touching him. What would this rabbi who had every bit of authority to chastise her openly, what would this man do if I really tell him who I am? How will he respond if I share with him what is really going on in my life? What are the implications? She's terrified. What will he do? And then not only him, what will the people do? Will they pick up stones to stone me for making them unclean? Will they realize that maybe it was me who touched them on her way to Jesus? And then I wonder, like, why would Jesus, if he knew that, why would he even put her on Front Street like that? Why would he even ask the question? But he understood something, that while he had a whole lot of people around him and he was getting bumped and touched by a lot of people, there was something special about this touch. This touch that invoked power from him that was unlike any other touch that he had experienced in that moment. This was a special touch, and Jesus knew, and he set her up. I truly believe he set her up to tell her story. Why, you ask? He set her up to tell her testimony, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And why did he do that? I believe, number one, for the crowd. They needed to know what was happening. What happened in her life was so transformative. These people needed to be witness. They needed to hear the reviews about what had happened to this woman. So Jesus set her up to tell her story for them, and not even just for them, but for her. Think about the courage it would take, what she would have to let go of in order to step into the truth and share it. It took courage, it took bravery to share with others, but how else would they know the power of this Jesus if she didn't have the boldness to tell somebody her truth, to tell somebody what God had done for her? So Jesus set her up. He's so cool like that. And I love Jesus' response. After she poured out her whole truth to him, Jesus looked at her and he said, he said to her, daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He said to her, daughter, not unclean woman, not woman with no name, not outcast woman, not woman with no value. He renamed her daughter. (laughs) Hallelujah. He renamed her daughter and he said, your faith has healed you. Not only did he heal her body, but it goes on and says, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He not just healed her body, but he healed her mind, body, and soul, releasing her, freeing her from all the stuff that she carried. Can you imagine how she just poured it all out? At this point, she didn't care anymore. She just gave it all to Jesus and he freed her. And as I read her story, every time I'm so connected to it. And I remember in my own life, I told you guys how I lived all those years and and, and, and just carrying and piling on guilt and shame. And I piled it on me in so many different ways. If I had enough time, my gosh, so many things happened. But I continued to pursue Jesus. And so one year in 2010, I was the worship director at a church And I decided to bring my team to a worship conference called Deeper Level that was actually here in Houston, Texas. And it was hosted by Israel Houghton. And y'all don't know who Israel is, do you? Like, right. I love Israel Houghton. And I love, especially the upbeat stuff, you know, Lord, you are good on your mind. I love it. I think it's amazing. And so I brought this team here. And if you've ever been to an Israel Houghton concert, it was just live. It was so exciting. And so this music was just loud and it was strong and the lights were up and we were up praising and having this wonderful time. I like to dance and we're just going around and just doing our thing. And so then it was a part of the service where he had everybody sit down and they were sitting down kind of like you guys. And it got really calm and really quiet. And... Um, He came out on the stage and the band kind of went their way and he came out with his guitar. He sat down, it was maybe just he he, um, and a 
maybe a person playing the cajon. And he sits down, and it's really quiet, just like this. And he starts playing this song that hadn't come out yet, so nobody had heard it. And he said, he said, from first to last, you knew my days, future and past. You saw everything when I would fail, when I would win, when I would need grace to start again. Nothing surprises you, nothing surprises you about me, Jesus. Nothing that I could do, nothing could separate you from me, Lord. You see me, you know me, you love me madly. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there, and he's singing these words, and I feel this knot start stirring in my belly, and it goes up my chest into my throat, and I'm trying my best to hold it together. And then he gets to the bridge of the song, and he says, you're not mad at me, you're not mad at me, you're more than enough, and you're madly in love with me. And this girl, I sat there, and all of a sudden, I was done. And people are looking around like, what is wrong with her? Somebody, ushers, please, come get her. But I didn't care. They had no idea what I had been carrying for all those years. They had no idea what I had pressed my way through. They had no idea how thick that crowd was, how deep my pain was, how much I had struggled with guilt and shame from sin. They had no idea, and I didn't care anymore. And in that moment, he said those words, and I heard Jesus saying to me, you're not mad at me. And I felt like Jesus said to me, daughter, why are you carrying weight from sin that I forgave you for long ago? Why are you holding against yourself something that I don't hold against you? I died for that. I gave my life for that. And I heard Jesus say to me, daughter, <laughs> your faith, you're persistently going to church when you didn't feel like it. You're persistently listening to Veggie Tales every time the kids wanted to hear it. You're persistently leading people in worship and singing, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. I can't pay my bills right now, but you are good and your mercy endures forever. I don't know how I'm going to get through this season, but you are good and your mercy endures forever going to small group and taking my kids to children's church and just doing the thing, just following. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. And it wasn't like things changed immediately overnight. I know I told you I raised those boys, and it's not like some husband showed up the next day. Truth be told, I raised those kids by myself for 23 years. 23. And I was like, really, God? When he coming? Like, seriously. Is he coming? Like, all of that. But then I realized, and God had to free me from wanting the wrong things. God had to show me that the end goal is not a husband. The end goal is freedom in me. And I need you to recognize that who you are in Christ has nothing to do with the people that are attached to you, whether you're married or whether you're not. If you're single, be free and single. If you're married, be free and be married. But that wasn't the end goal. God has purposed and called us right where we are. And as I learned that, as, as I started to walk in that, I became more free. And just like he told this woman, he said, be free. And I'm like, what do you mean, be free? What, what's that mean? He said, walk in the freedom in which I've given you. Let it go. Just, oh, you ever feel like you're just carrying weight? And God's like, be free of all that. And you find yourself walking a little taller. You find yourself, for, for women, you wear your heels a little higher. <laughs> you don't care what people think about you. Why? Because I'm a daughter of the Most High God. 
I'm a son of the Most High King. And nothing defines me except him. Nothing identifies me except him. And so if you don't leave with anything else today, I want you to leave with this one nugget. And it's that desperation, faith, and truth poured out to Jesus brings healing and freedom. Freedom to walk in victory. Freedom to walk in faith when things are hard and things are tough. It will be. I'm sorry. It will be. But living through hard times in Christ is a whole lot better than living through hard times without him. Because he is faithful. He's faithful. And what I love is that the Bible tells us that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I promise you, I would not be standing up here today had it not been for God blessing me and calling me daughter, for that faith walk, for that desperation and allowing God to be my last resort. And so even though Jesus was my last resort and her last resort, he was also her launching pad into the rest of her life. And he wants to be the same for you. So if you're here today and you know Jesus, I'm so glad to hear that. And no matter where you sit in this moment, no matter who you are or what you've been through, if you're carrying dead weight from your past, God says, be free. If you're carrying guilt and shame and regret, God says, be free. If you keep trying to keep up with the Joneses, God says, be free. Live the life that I've called you to live. Pursue me and let me handle everything else. And if for those of you who are exploring faith and you've heard about this man named Jesus, let me tell you something. It's for real. And I just want to encourage you to give him a shot. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he wants nothing more than for him to be your last resort and your launching pad into the rest of your life of freedom in him. So I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you and ask you to do one favor for me. In light of all this, one key part about this story was her truth her sharing that truth, her testimony. You may not get a mic, but if I brought a mic out to all the people in this room at every campus and watching online, the line would go forever when we begin to tell about the goodness of God and what he's done in our lives. And so I want to encourage you this week, if you, would you find somebody to share just a bit of your story with and watch God ignite faith in them? that could lead them to freedom that they've never experienced. He wants to be their last resort and our last resort and our launching pad into the rest of our lives. Can I pray for you? Father, we love you so much. You are an amazing, faithful, glorious, and beautiful God. And we're so grateful for the things, even that you've taken us through the hard times, the hard seasons, the rough things, because you've ignited a faith in us as we pursue you faithfully, God. And sometimes it doesn't even feel like it's faithful pursuit. But God, we keep trying. We just take one step at a time. So God, for those who are lost and they feel like they don't know which way to go, to go Lord God, I pray that you would illuminate just their next step. Make it like a yellow brick road, just one step at a time. God, in faith, I pray that you would just lead them in that direction, God. And for those that don't know you, I pray that you would open up their hearts to invite you into their lives, to allow you to be everything that you desire to be, for, to allow them to experience your love and mercy and grace and forgiveness that only comes through your son, Jesus Christ. You have done the work, God. Help us to walk in freedom because of that work. And we'll make sure that we're careful to give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. Why? Because you deserve every bit of it. We love you so much, and we glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.